Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our new weekly Soul of the Parsha class. We have now reached the Parsha e Vayechi. Vayechi is the twelfth and final Parsha of the first book in the five books of Moses for the closing Parsha of Genesis. So it's an important step in our journey this year. We're closing the first book. And our topic for today is, what is the good life? How can we define the good life? What years of our life, what period of our lives can we define as the good years, our good years? People argue within themselves, among themselves, as they look back on their lives or they're getting ready for the new stage of their life, they're asking themselves, what, what are the best years? What were the best years of my life? And maybe if they haven't happened yet, how do I make the next years the best years of my life? And of course, if you want to be optimistic, you want to think about your life as constantly improving and getting better and better and better. You want every year of your life to be better than the previous year. So that for, in order to do that, in order to uh, strive for that, you need to ask yourself, what is a good year? What is a good life? What makes a certain period of my life good? So that's, that's our question for, for today. Um, so, how does the Parsha, what does the Parsha tell us about? The Parsha is called Vayechi. Vayechi means, uh, he lived. Who lives? Yaakov. It's very interesting, it's the second time we have this, so far, that we have a Parsha that has the word life in its title. The first time was Chayei Sarah. But, that talks about the death of the person whose life we are talking about. So in Chayei Sarah, this was very extreme. Uh, she dies uh, at the very, very, very beginning, uh, because it really sums up her life. It's called Chayei Sarah, because that's the opening words. But it tells us about the end of the life of Sarah. And then the, ho the whole parasha takes place after she passes away. And in a way, it talks about the legacy of Sarah, what Sarah leaves behind, and in what ways in what ways her life affects uh, what happens after she passes away, how it affects her children getting married, her, her, her son getting married, and again, how she's able to maybe guide or influence this world from on high after she passes away. This time, uh, we're talking about the end of the life of Yaakov. Since this is the end of Genesis, Genesis is the book of the fathers and mothers, the patriarchs and matriarchs, and Yaakov is the third and final one. And this is his last chapter. This is the chapter in which Yaakov reaches the end of his life, and his purpose, and that's what the parasha is dedicated to, is transmitting the blessings, the, uh, the message maybe, uh, what final words and, you know, things he has to do, the final things he needs to transmit to his sons, the future tribes of Israel, especially Yosef. Yosef, in many ways, is uh, unique among the children in the sense that he doesn't become a tribe. His two children become two tribes. There's no Yosef tribe. Yosef is sort of an intermediate between Yaakov and the tribes. So, and both of them die in this parasha. First Yaakov dies, and then, many, uh, several decades later, but only a few verses later, Yosef dies as well, and that's how Genesis ends. It ends with these two, maybe the two main protagonists of the final half of Genesis, father and son, head of the tribal, the big tribal family of Israel, and his special, unique son, whose job it is to sort of mediate, as I said, between Yaakov and the tribes. They both pass away. And, but this time, it's not like Chayei Sarah. Yaakov is alive for most of the Parsha, and he gives all his blessings. And the reason, uh, it, and so it's called Vayechi, we're talking about his life, but on the very second verse, we're talking about his life nearing its end. So Chayei Sarah spoke about, there's a, in both of them, we, we have a tension between life and death, right? There's life in the title, but the protagonist dies, and there's sort of a tension between these two levels. But whereas for Sarah, it was life going on after her death, this is the end of one's life. How does one use, make use, or use the final years of one's life? So let's read the first two verses. 
It starts, Jacob lived, lived 17 years in the land of Egypt so that the span of Jacob's life came to 147 years. That's the first verse. Second verse, and the time approached for Israel to die. In the first verse he was called Yaakov, in the second one he's called Israel, and take note of that because we'll talk about this later. So it starts with summing up two periods of his life. First, the last 17 years of his life that he spent in Egypt after reuniting with his son. And then all together, he was 147 when he died. And then the second verse begins with the words, And the time approached, Vayikrevu yemei Israel, the days of Israel, that's the literal translation, came near, or near their end. And he was about to die. So now he's summing up his life. So we're talking about this. This is not, again, this is the end of life, but still within life. And the question is, how do you, what do you do in those final years? And how do you sum up your life? How do you look back? And how do you look forward to your last days? What do you do in your last days? And of course, we never know when our last day is. So it's a, really a question for everyone at every age. Every age, we don't know when, you know, the decree will come out that we, God forbid, our life is going to end. So this consciousness of life may be ending and how do we make use of our time is a very vital question for really for everyone. Now, the Parsha begins, as I said, with two numbers, but one in particular. The second number is 147, that's the entire period, that's the, that's, that's the Yaakov's age when he dies. He was 147. But it starts with, Vayechi Yaakov be'eretz Mitzrayim shvayesra shana. Yaakov lived in Eretz Mitzrayim, in the land of Egypt, 17 years. So it starts with a number. The number is the last years of Yaakov's life. What characterized those years? It was the years in which he reunited with Yosef, and he realized Yosef was alive. He always suspected, but he didn't know for sure, and then he realized that Yosef is alive. He reunites with him, and in, in fact, the entire family is reunited. The whole decades-long dispute between the Yosef and his siblings is resolved, and all of his troubles are behind him, and he has the quiet 17 years before he passes away. So that's why the Torah focuses on this number. The 17 years, final 17 years of Yaakov's life, spent not in Eretz Israel, in Egypt, however, being very, very good, very, you know, restful. He, he finally, after having a very long, hard life, he gets to have rest in his final 17 years. Now, the number 17 has already appeared in the Torah. And it has appeared in not so far ago. It appeared in the beginning of Parashat Vayeshev, which tells the beginning of Yosef's story. Yosef's story began three Parashat ago in Vayeshev, and here it ends alongside his father. And that Parsha began after it says that Yaakov Vayeshev, that he sat, that he settled, in the land of his fathers, it says, Eletoldot Yaakov Yosef, these are the offsprings, or the history, the chronicles of Yaakov. Yosef was 17 years when he was a shepherd with his brothers, and he accompanied the, the children of the, of the maidservants and all this. So the number 17 has already appeared. Number 17 was mentioned regarding the first 17 years of Yosef's life. So twice in Genesis, not that far away, not that far apart from each other, uh, where the Torah makes a point of mentioning two periods, uh, each containing 17 years. The first one, that was a few parts ago, was the first 17 years of Yosef's life. And the second, right now, is the last 17 years of his father Yaakov's life, right? And our focus today is to compare and contrast and get a feeling for what happened during those two blocks of 17 years and what made them similar and what made them different. And this would help us get a good idea of how to make use of our time and how to, how to really relate to our own lives. Now, note that, of course, there was a long gap 
between these two period, periods of Yaakov's life. And there was a 22-year gap in between. So let's recount. Yaakov gives birth to Yosef when he's 91 years old, not in Eretz Israel. that's still when he's still in Haran, he's still only called Yaakov, he hasn't battled the angel and was given the name Yosef, Rachel hasn't died yet, obviously, and Yosef is the, the last son that is born in Haran. Benjamin is going to be born on the way to Eretz Israel. And then he, he, he still has a dispute with Lavan, and he gets over it, and he gets all the way to Eretz Israel. Rachel gives birth to Benjamin and dies. And then, when Yosef becomes 17, and at this point Yaakov is 108, uh, Yosef is being sold to the Ishmaelites and is carried all the way to Egypt. And 22 very bad years ensue in which Yaakov is unwilling to mourn, fully mourn, for Yosef. He's very much clinging on to Binyamin, who's the only remnant he has from Rachel, the only memory he has of Rachel, the second son he has from her, and is extremely sad because his, his heart doesn't really accept the fact that Yosef died, because in fact Yosef didn't die. So the, the 22 years are very bad for Yaakov, and it's like having, it's, people have this, you know, when your child or a relative, a close one, is missing but never found, and you never have rest until even a body is found. Even if a body is found, it's better than nothing. So the very harsh 20, 22 years. And of course for Yosef, it's also very harsh, because Yosef is thrown into the pit, then taken to Egypt, then he's put wrongly accused of doing something uh, to his master's wife, and he's put in prison, spends two more years, and then he's able to make it in Egypt, and he becomes almost like a prince, but of course, it's still not very good because he's detached from his father and his family. And then begin the final 17 years. Yaakov is now 130 years old, that's when he gets to Egypt, and then he reunites with Yosef, and that's the final 17 years, right? So that's we have here 17 years, 22 years of absence, which by the way, the 22 years in which Yosef was missing parallel and correspond, that's the exact same amount of time that Yaakov himself was separate from his own father, Yitzchak. When he ran away from Esav and went to Haran and then married the two wives and had all the children, it took exactly 22 years. So it was, it, it, it's almost like, you know, midak and neged midah. It's, uh, you know, there's a balance. It's a mirror image. It's something that he had to go through he, he was separate from his own father for 22 years, and he had to have the same experience that his own favorite son would need to be separate from him for 22 years. So that's also something very interesting that's going on here. There was something very important about those 22 years, which we're going to try and understand. Now, there's a famous uh, g- gematria idea that starts with the Baal Aturim. Baal Aturim, famous commentator, and he's famous also for making a lot of gematria, right? A lot of calculating the numerical value of words. So he says, right, the name of the parsha is Vayechi, and he lived. And he talks about the life, the life of Yaakov coming to its end. And then he says, Vayechi, if you do the gematria, Vav is 6, and Yud is 10, and Chet is 8, and Yud is another 10. If you put it all together, you get 34. 34 is 2 times 17. So the name of the parasha, Vayechi, is 17, 17, 2 times 17. And in fact, the word seven, the number 17, you don't have that many words that uh, you, you can get, you find the, if for such a small number, it's hard to find Hebrew words that match this number. But one of the most famous ones is the word Tov, good. Tet Vav Bet is 9, 6, 2, together equal 17. 17 equals good. So, Vayechi equals Tov Tov, good, good. You have two periods of life, and both are good. And why are both good? Because both of these periods of life involved the overlap of Yosef and Yaakov, his father, they lived, they were together. They were together for the first 17 years of Yosef's life, then separate for 22 years, 
and then again together for the last 17 years of Yaakov's life. So altogether it's Tov Tov, and this is Vayechi. So, says the Baal Turim, the parsha opens with the word Vayechi in order to tell us that the only years in which he truly lived were those 34 years, although they were 22 years apart between both periods. But those 34 years that he was with Yosef, from the moment Yosef was born until Yosef died, and from the moment they were reunited until Yaakov died, sorry, from the moment Yosef was born to the moment Yosef was sold, and then from the moment they were reunited to the moment uh, Yaakov passed away, these two periods of his life are the only years that could be considered a life. That he didn't really, life was so hard for him until Yosef was born. And so hard for him during the 20 years, 22 years of Yosef's absence that he, he couldn't call it a life. So there was only 34 years that he lived. Says the Balatur. After he says that, he has, he has another contradictory interpretation. He says, now, another thing, another interpretation. Uh, doesn't go with the gematria. He says, Yaakov lived in Eretz Mitzrayim for 17 years, means that up until now he didn't live. Only the last 17 years of his life could be defined as living. Before that, it was extremely hard. And he quotes Yaakov saying previously that Ki ered el bni avel I will go down to hell to the underworld, still mourning. I will never fully mourn the loss of my son, uh, Yosef. Later he says something similar about Binyamin. So, this is very interesting. So the, ba- so the Baal Turim tells us two contradictory ideas. One idea, 34 years of Yaakov's life could be defined as actual living. The rest was maybe a living nightmare. It was so hard, you couldn't call it a life. You can't call it a life. But 34 years, you can't call it a life. Second interpretation, scratch that. Only the last 17 years, half of that, could be considered a life, the final 17. So we have here, according to both ideas, what for sure is that the last 17 years were very good. But the, what, what is debatable is whether the first 17 years, from the moment Yosef was born to the moment he was sold, were they good or weren't they good? According to one interpretation, they were good, and according to another, they weren't good. So this is very, very interesting. Now, the idea that only the last 17 years were good goes along with quite a few other things that we're told by other interpreters and by the sages. So, for example, uh, there's a famous question. Uh, if you look at the, the Torah scroll, the Torah scroll, as not as it's printed in books, but as it's written the actual Torah scroll. There's something very unique, the famous question, very unique about the opening of this parasha. It's the only parasha out of all the 54. It's the only parasha that when it begins, there's no way to tell. If you look at the Torah scroll, there's no space between the final word of the previous parasha and the first word of this parasha. There's always either a, a gap between within that line in the Torah scroll or there, it's a new line. But you never have, uh, except this parsha, that it starts immediately. And of course, there's no punctuation in the Torah scroll, so it's like there's no way of telling that a parsha begins here. And this is closed. This is called a closed parsha, parasha stuma. So then the midrash asks, why is this parsha closed? Why is it so closed that you don't have a gap, you don't have a space? And and three answers are given. But, and Rashi quotes two of them. But the third one that Rashi doesn't quote is God closed up the bad chapter of Yaakov's life. He ended all his troubles. That's one of the interpretations. right? So that goes along with, again with the second interpretation by the Baal Aturim, That up until he was 130, when he came to Egypt reunited with Yosef, it was all full of troubles a troublesome life, that's the word tzarot, troubles. And only now did he have, it goes along with the, with the second pirush, but the 
Baal Turim. What were all the troubles, by the way? Rashi tells us in a different place. When ya- Yaakov is willing, finally, previous parsha to send Binyamin to Egypt, if you remember, the, the, the children of, of Yaakov, they go twice to Egypt. They go first to go to Egypt, and then they come back without Shimon, Simon. And then they go back with Binyamin, and, and Yaakov is left with no son around him. And, and then he tells them, uh, he blesses them, may God give you mercy. And, and the particular name used for God is the name Shin Dalidud. It's a name that has to do with limitation, with stopping things, putting a limit to things. So then Rashi says, he begged God at that moment to put a stop to his troubles. And then Rashi enumerates seven troubles that he had during his life. And the first trouble is uh, Lavan, Lavan giving him a hard time, cheating him and so on. And then the battle with Esav, and then Rachel passing away, and then Dina, the daughter, what happened to her. And then Yosef being taken away, and then Shimon being taken away, and then Binyamin being taken away. It ends up seven troubles all together. And so the final trouble was Binyamin going away. That's why he says it at that particular time. As Binyamin is being carried off, he says, God give you mercy. And may give, this is the seventh trouble, the seventh disaster that I'm having. And God, please make this stop. And of course, it does stop. And then they go back and tell him Yosef is alive and he's reunited. And that ends the, the, his seven troubles that have, you know... Uh, been carrying over all those 130 years. So that means all, and, and in fact he says that when he comes to Egypt, when he comes to Egypt and Pharaoh asks him, who are you and how old are you? And he says, I'm 130 years old, few and bad have been the years of my life. So he says, explicit, it's an explicit verse, all of my 130 years were bad. That is the opposite of good, so so it wasn't good. Only the last 17 years are good. However, remember, we still have the, the Gimatria and the Perush, the interpretation of the Balatur, the first one, that those 17 years, out of the 130, the 17 years uh, that he spent between age 91 and age 108, that he spent with young Yosef, were also good. So again, we have this tension. So what do we make of this? What does it mean that he had uh, 17 good years, but maybe not so good, because he also defines them as bad, but then he had 17 years that, according to all opinions, were the best. So there's a famous saying by the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe. The Lubavitcher Rebbe, he would meet, of course, a lot of people. And he would ask them what's going on with their lives, what are they doing, and how are they doing... You know, he wanted everyone to be an emissary and to be a shaliach and to do as many things as they can, to spread Judaism and to teach and to do good deeds. And, and people would tell, sometimes tell him, you know, what I'm doing is I think it's good enough. I think it's good enough. It's good. It's good. I don't need to do more than that. I'm doing good. And then he would, he would tell them, if good is good, isn't better better? That's what the, the things that he, the, the saying that he said in Yiddish, it goes, oh, if good is good. Is better, nicht better? If good is good, isn't better better? And by doing, by saying that, he would encourage them never settle for just good. Good is good, right? Good is good. Good is great. But if good is good, you will have to agree that better is even better. So why stop at good? And that's maybe one thing we can say. We can say that the first word, the first seventeen years were good. But when the seven, the last seventeen years come along. That is, when Yosef comes to Egypt, he's reunited, sorry, when Yaakov comes to Egypt, and he's reunited with Yosef, and then he sums up, he says, up until now it was all bad compared to this. Now, it, the better is so better that I now retroactively understand that the 17 good years weren't so good, really, in comparison to this. You can, it can get better. So what we have here is two levels of good. And the first level being such a level that, from a certain perspective, can be seen as bad. So now we want to crack this open, and we want to understand. It's not, again, it's not like you have 130 years, bad years, as Yaakov says when he gets to Egypt, 
and then 17 good years, is that out of the 130, there's another, there's a special period of time that's in between. That's not, that it, it's contained within the 130 bad years, few and bad were my years, but on the other end, it's 17, he has Yosef, he loves Yosef, and, and it's 17 is, equals good, right? So it's, there's something interesting going on here that we need to figure out. Now, it goes like this. We First, what characterizes these two periods of time is, as we said before, this is the overlap of Yaakov and Yosef together. There were 91 years before, there's going to be 22 years in between, but what, ca- what characterizes these two periods of time is that Yaakov and Yosef were together. Now, of course, Yosef is one of many sons, 12 sons and a daughter, but again, Yosef is special. I said this in the beginning. Yosef is special because he is the conduit through which Yaakov can transmit his message and his blessing and his legacy to all the other tribes. And in fact, that's the reason, as I said, that Yosef isn't a tribe. His two sons become tribes. also happens in this parsha. So, what does it mean that the two periods of life that can be considered good, even regardless of the discrepancy or the difference between them, that these two periods of life, meaning that the best time of your life is that when you're able to communicate your message to the next generation. There were many children before Yosef. He had their company during those 22 years, but it wasn't, it, it, that's not it. It's not the thing. You can't call it good. It's not good because you need the your you know your disciple or your what's the word your helper your second in command the the one who gets you the most not because he's your favorite son or anything like that but because he's the one through which your life's work will pass on. It could be a, a, a a child, could be a student, could be not a person. It could be the thing that you need to do that will transmit whatever it is you need to do in this world, that you came into this world to do, that will leave a mark and will carry on after you. It could be your life's project, it could be the thing you have to write, it's your calling. In, in, this, in Yaakov's case, it's personified in his son Yosef. So the only times, even without going into the, the difference between them, the only times that can be called good are when they were working together on this project that Yaakov was educating, giving Yosef what he needed to get. This is, of course, the main reason he gave him the special dress that he gave him. The special dress was part of the communication between them of what he had to teach them, teach him, that he couldn't teach the other, the other kids. So that's the first thing we need to understand. Why those 17 years are good, those two periods of 17, it's because they were together, because these years are used for the atmo. The rest is, the first 91 years are just in preparation for this, and the 22 years in between, so that we have to figure out now. But, but those 17, those two periods of 17, are when he's working on giving, you know, putting it all funneling it into this one kid that will be able to, to then pass it on to the tribes and to the posterity. Now, clearly, now we want to characterize the two. So we're going to go in two ways. So the first characteristic is very simple, and we said it already. We can say that the first period, right, both of them have to do with father and son, Yaakov and Yosef, but the first 17... Ha, ha, are more connected to Yosef because it's the first years of Yosef's life and the second period of 17 are more connected to Yaakov because it's the last 17 years of his life. Interesting. We would think that if the whole idea is the father passing on something to the son that the father would be the focal point of the first period and the son the focal point of the second. But here it turns out the opposite because the first period is the is is the first seventeen years life uh, the, the first seventeen years of the son's life, and the last seventeen years of the last seventeen years of the father's life. So in a way, both periods have to do with both, 
characters. But the first, the center of gravity lies with the sun, and, 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 and that's how they're called, right? Uh, uh, that, how was the verse that, um, the, uh, Yosef ben Shvayetzchena, Yosef was 17 years old. Right? It goes with the word Yosef, the first one. And the second is Vayechi Yaakov, Shvayetzchena, Yaakov lived 17 years. So the first 17 years go with Yosef more, and the last 17 years go with Yaakov more, although both of them have to do with the overlap. So that's one characterization. Now we'll go into the, into the second one. In order to understand the second one, we need to open up a very beautiful, very, very deep reading of the Zohar for the first two verses of our parsha. So again, the first two verses says, Vayechi Yaakov, Yaakov lived in the land of Egypt. And second verse is, and the, the days of Israel neared their end. Right? So, the Zohar uh, tries to figure this out. He says, the Zohar starts like this. So we're going to go over this, this little Zohar piece. Zohar says, why is it that when Yaakov's life is mentioned, he's called Yaakov, but then when his death is mentioned, he's called Israel? Right? Both of them are his names, but why use the first name when talking about his life and the second, holier, higher name, the name that he got when he vanquished the angel? Uh, why is that mentioned regarding his death? So in order to answer that, the Zohar opens, asks another question. And he says, the exact, ter- the exact phrasing, wording, used when, when we're talking about Israel, Yaakov Israel nearing his end, it says, Vayikrevu yemei Israel lamut. And the days of Israel neared his end. Now it says days in the plural. So the Zohar asks, what does it mean that his days of dying or the days of his death? That, that's how it's, how it's read in Hebrew. You only die, your death is instantaneous. You know, maybe dying takes, could take a lot of time. We can say that all life we're dying. But death itself is instantaneous. So what does it mean days? And then the Zohar gives his revolutionary, original, beautiful uh, interpretation. And he says the following. What does it mean that his days neared? So the Zohar says, when one reaches the final moment, because again, death is instantaneous, it's one moment. <coughs> During that final moment, as your soul is being taken out of your body and goes back to its source, to God above, all of the days of your life, this is why it's days in the plural, all of the days of your life come near, gather round, they all come up and they stand before God in that one moment. It's like the, the famous cliche that as you're dying, your life passes, flashes before your eyes. So the Zohar says this, but in a different way. Not that it flashes before your eyes, but it all comes to stand before God Almighty. The day, the moment you die, your entire life is, is nearing, it's gathering up and stands before God. And then the Zohar says, Fortunate is he, or blessed is he, for whom all the days can come without shame. That they all come, and they're not ashamed of coming, because there's nothing bad in them. So, so blessed is he who died a righteous person, who made use, good use, of all of his days. All of his days can come before God, and there's no shame, and they stand there, and they, they tell, this is what I did this day, and that day, and that day, and that day. And then the Zohar says, but woe to those whose days are ashamed of coming. And then the Zohar takes opposite extreme, right? No one is, is in the world can be found in that extreme, maybe. But the opposite extreme is that as a very wicked, a consummately wicked person, for whom all the days are ashamed. All the days were misspent, misused, or abused. And they, and they all come, and they, they have nothing to, sh- to show for them. And then the Zohar says, when those days come, they just, they just puff, they vanish away. 
They don't come up. The only thing that comes up are the good deeds that you did. The time that you wasted, the time that you did bad things, the time that were had no value to them, they don't come up. They come, they, they feel ashamed, and for good reason. They, they just go, they, they, they disappear in a puff of smoke. And it's possible that you come up to heaven with maybe one day, two days, ten days, hundred days. Take look at look at your life and ask yourself how many time you spent on really substantial stuff, and that's the stuff you're going to be left with when you go up to heaven. That's what the Zohar says. The rest is just nothing. So the Zohar makes it very extreme because that's how it goes when you want to have a spectrum of character types. You need to have the two poles. So the two poles are the the consummate righteous person who comes up in all of his days come up with him, and this is Israel when he dies. And the opposite, and the, on the other end of the spectrum, you have the consummately evil person for whom n- no, no day goes up. Um, and clearly, obviously, again, almost everyone in the world, if not everyone in the world, is somewhere in between this. And you have good days and bad days. Not good, day, good days and bad days as we're accustomed to say good for me or bad for me, but in, in which I was good or I was not good. But then, and then, and then the Zohar says, and this is why the second verse of the parasha, talking about the days of uh, nearing their end, talks about Israel, because Israel was more consummately righteous, was more whole, more complete, uh, the Yaakov, and then the Zohar asks itself, but Yaakov was also a righteous, was also a tzaddik, and when he was very young, we were told, Yaakov ish tam yoshev halim, he was wholehearted, he was complete, a dweller of tents, who was tam, tam is complete or whole. So the Zohar answers, right, it's, a, it's an internal debate, the Zohar says, yes, Yaakov was also whole, also a tzaddik, but not as whole, not as complete, not as righteous as Israel. And then the Zohar makes a distinction. Here the the Zohar goes into the intermediate level, because first we had the wicked man and the righteous man. But now we have two kinds of righteous. We have Yaakov and Israel, and both were whole. But basically Israel was more. So then the Zohar says, there are two kinds of, of a righteous person. One for whom some days were good and some weren't so good. This is what is called in other places a tzaddik she'ei no gamur. It's a, an inconsummate tzaddik. He's a tzaddik, but he's not a consummate tzaddik. There's still some bad in him. And that bad manifests in, in some bad days, days in which he, he was, wasn't perfect <laughs> and, uh, or less than, less than perfect. And, and he, but he's righteous also. And this is Yaakov. And then there's a consummate tzaddik, this is Israel. And of course it's the same person. So, now, we can use this, going back to the two periods of 17 years, and we have another characterization for what makes them apart. The idea that the Zohar ends up with, it extremely parallels the idea we got from the two interpretations of the Baal Turim in the beginning. The first, the, the two interpretations went. He had two periods of good years, seventeen, seventeen, and second interpretation only the last seventeen years were good. So make up your mind, right? And here it's the same thing. He, there were ya- Yaakov had two names, both were good, both were righteous, but Israel was more righteous, right? So it's all the same idea. They were both righteous, but but one of them was more. So now we can say that the first 17 years were more associated with Yaakov. And when you think about it, when they started, he was still only called Yaakov. Right? The first 17 years started when Yosef was born. Yosef was born. He was back in Haran. He was only called Yaakov then. It was during those 17 years that he got the name Israel. But they, when they started, he was only Yaakov. And then the final 17 years, as he dies, and that's why the verse tells us, is that he they have to do more with Israel. So, let's put it all together and see what we have. Two periods of time, both of them have to do with the overlap of Yaakov and Yosef. But, 
the first 17 years, the, the focal point is Yosef, right? Yosef was 17 years when he was sold. But they also had to do with Yaakov, but specifically with the name Yaakov, with the, uh, with the, uh, the younger Yaakov, the Yaakov who still didn't have his higher self, his second higher name. Or he had it, but not really had it, because when they started, he didn't really have it. So again, the first 17 years have to do with both Yosef and Yaakov, but Yosef is the central point, and Yaakov is only Yaakov. Second period of 17 years, again, both of them, but Yaakov becomes the central figure, and but within Yaakov, it's Dafka, the higher name, Israel. Okay? Right? You're, you're, you're with me. So, again, two periods of 17, both of them have father and son, but there's something about the first period of life in which the son is the focal point, but the father isn't fully mature yet. Second period of time, the father becomes mature and becomes the focal point. So now, and now we're, we're now this is where we all, we, 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 this whole class was to get to this point. So what I want to say now is the, is the following. There was something about, again, both periods of time have to do with working on the project of your life, your life's project, transmitting what you need, in this case, Yaakov, transmitting what he has to Yosef. But there was something about the first 17 years that wasn't perfect. Something was off. Yosef was the central point. But there was something about both of them. They were very much wrapped within each other. The, the Parashat Vayeshev, when the first 17 was mentioned, it starts, Ele toldot Yaakov Yosef. These are the chronicles of, ya- of Yaakov Yosef, who was 17 years old. And the Yaakov Yosef put together, that it almost creates a name, and in fact it did become a name. There are famous people called Yaakov Yosef. This is because of them being so intimately connected. What I want to say now is that they were too much connected. They were too much wrapped. They weren't individuated properly from each other. The child was still very much under the, you know, the skirt or the apron, you know, of his father, too much connected to the father. And you see things that are off. He was playing with his hair. He was saying, Lashon Ara, saying bad things about his brothers. He was very naive in the way he spoke. He created envy and even hatred from his uh, siblings. And there was something about it. He was... It was, he was living, it was his life, right? But he was, uh, there was something a, a bit too young and a bit off. And of course, the whole 22 years that he had to pass was in order to completely cleanse him from any remnant of pride or, or you know, something that wasn't pure. And there was, there was some reason, it's not just their brother's fault that they couldn't listen to his dreams. They felt something was wrong. And he said, Lashon Arai, he said, you know, bad gossip about his brothers, that's, that's, a, that's something forbidden, you shouldn't do that. So, and why could, why could he do that? Because he felt that he was protected by his father. He knew that my father loves me and likes me, he was too much with the father. The father was also too much involved with the son, meaning, so when, the, when ya- Yosef was born, he was, still was only called Yaakov. And then at some point, when Yosef was young, he got the name Israel. But he didn't make full use of it. What does it mean? He felt, my life, it doesn't matter what I do with my life now. What matters is the project, the future, my son, Yosef. Everything has to, I'm maybe a little bit of a lost case. Yeah, I got the name Israel, but I can't do much with it because it's, now it's all up to what I give to Yosef. And and that's when you're focused too much on the future and too much on the project and too much on your, the person or the thing or the project that carries you further. And you don't, you don't focus on yourself, on the now, too much on the future. The previous parish, I think it was, we, talk, we spoke about, not the previous one, but a little bit before, I spoke about years and days and we said years have to do with planning your future and days have to do with living every day and focusing on yourself. 
And there was something about Yaakov that didn't do this. And the reason those 17 years came to an end is they were good. They were good because Yaakov was focusing on on the main project of his life, you know, getting his son ready to pass on this legacy of Abraham and Yitzchak and the connection to God and to transmit it to the seven tribes. So that's why they were good, but they weren't so good and they could be seen as bad in relation to the future 17 years because the father and son, the, the, the two levels that one needs to work on, which is working on the project I need to give to the future, but also working on just myself as a servant of God, it wasn't separate enough. There wasn't individuation. They weren't separate enough. They were too much wrapped one inside the other. The 22 bad years, the really bad years, came in order to force individuation upon both of them. Yeah, Yosef was forced to make it on his own without his father's protection, without his father's uh, guidance, and without being a favorite, without you know shining above his, his siblings. He had to make it on, on his own, in the pit, in Egypt, in the prison, in, in Pharaoh's palace. Yaakov who is now on the way to becoming, really becoming Israel, not like he became before, he just got the name, but really becoming Israel, to the point that when he dies, it says that the days of Israel were nearing their end, not the days of Yaakov, because now he's really becoming Israel, is that now he needs to, he can't, you know, escape his own inner work, his own personal rectification, and say, well, I'm a lost case, maybe, and I'm just going to focus on making my son the most righteous man he can be. And many people get this. As they grow older, they say, well, you know, I'm a lost case, but maybe, God willing, my children will be able to do what I wasn't able to do, and they'll do a better job, and for me, it's anyway, it's, I'm too old to change, I'm too old to work on myself. No. The, the Yosef was taken away in a way that he, he didn't know if he was there or not, and he wasn't able to completely let go, and but he was really left alone. The first time he was left alone, he fought the angel and got the name Israel, right? By Yvater Yaakov Levado, he was alone. Now, it's not Yaakov being left alone, it's Israel being left alone. He needs another round of being left alone. The first time he was left alone, the most amazing thing in the world happened. He fought the demon, he fought Esav's angel, he got the name Israel. But it wasn't enough. He needs another alone time. And the final alone time, by the way, comes with the final trouble, the final disaster, with even Binyamin is taken away. Then he's really alone. That's the end of the 22 years. Just as he's about to begin the, seven, the, good, the really good 17 years. When Binyamin is taken, and then he says, and everything was done in order to avoid this. But now he's really, really alone. And then he's able to say, as he's coming to Egypt, you know what? All of my 130 years were bad, including the 17 with Yosef, because I didn't really make the, the distinction. You know, I didn't differentiate between teaching Yosef and guiding Yosef, but also at the same time working on myself, on bettering myself and connecting to Israel. Because there, and what is it good? What, what good is it that Yosef is the focal point of everything? And if he, the whole point is that he he carries on Israel, not Yaakov. What's the the whole purpose of the Avraham Yitzchak Yaakov is for Yaakov to get the name Israel, and this is the name that has to go to Yosef. So Yosef, the son, can be the, an amazing son if you put all your effort into the son. But the, the whole point is that you're able to give him something that's not directly given, that has to do with being your, your highest self, and then he can get that. But you, you only get that because as, this, as you're teaching your son, working on your future project, working on your shlichut, on your, on your, your life project, your life's project, you're also constantly being connected to your highest soul root and working your way up that 
internal, individual ladder. And he gets that when he's left alone again at, at the end of those 22 years. That was the whole purpose of those 22 years. So then, when he's reunited with Yosef for the final 17 years of his life, now everything is changed. Now, Yosef has become his own man and, you know, made it in his own right in, in Egypt. And also, Yaakov the father realized that he, the, the, now, he now the second period of transmitting something to Yosef begin, right? Because both periods have to do with the overlap of Yaakov and Yosef and transmitting what you need to your son. But now, now it's a, it's a, it's a better, it's a perfect, it's a, it's the best overlap. Now it's an overlap post differentiation, right? The first was pre differentiated. Now it's post differentiation. Post differentiation means now Yaakov is connected internally to his essential higher self, who is called Israel, and Yosef is also separate and you know has his own personality. And he's able to stand there. And then Yosef is able to, to you know, uh, suck in or not suck in, to take in the essence of Israel and really, uh, and, and, and really be the, the, the conduit for what he needs to be. And so this is something very, very beautiful we get out of all of this. We get that both these periods of time are called good because this is the, those moments, those days of your life in which you're focused on what I need to do. What's my life's project? I know what it is and I'm working on it. It's the best times. It's the good, it's the good times. These are the good times. But within them, they, they split into two periods of time. One in which I'm so wrapped up in my project, I'm forgetting myself. I'm saying, well, who, who, what does it matter if I'm a good person? As long as the project that I have to leave to the world, that's good. Wrong. And he pays the price. He pays the price of 22 years of separation, of being left alone again. It's a bit like the Alter Rebbe, that after the first prison, imprisonment, uh, he was told, now you have to carry teaching, your teachings, and so on. He had to have another imprisonment. <laughs> It didn't. It wasn't enough the first one. He needed the second one. It's like here, Yaakov needs a second alone time to be left alone in order to really connect with the name Israel. So then, the second seventeen years become the seventeen years in which he is going back to working on his project, but now it's it's really balanced. Now he's not, uh, you know, totally wrapped up in the project. He also is preparing for his own death, focusing on his own inner work, and that, in a way, transmits to Yosef on a much, much better level. And also, by the way, you see that he's able to to do something against Yosef's wishes. The first 17 years, they were so... He did everything Yosef wanted. And they were so close. But now, he's able to tell him, no, no, I'm going to switch your sons, and they're going to become two tribes, and Yosef is surprised, and that's the individuation. That's because they now became two different things. So that's the that's what we have from from looking closely at this two seventeen years. Final word, final idea. The image we had from the Zohar that when one dies, all of his days come, gather, and stand in one in in one instant, all together. They spread out spatially, because it's not temporal anymore. The the time has ended. One's lifetime has ended. And all the days come and and spread themselves before God, then we were told that the days wasted are all gone. Right? That's what the Zohar says. But if you look closely at the Zohar, you get something else. The Zohar says, you have one level of righteous person, that's Yaakov, some days were good, some not so good. And and the, the, the not so good days, the not perfect days are lost, right? But then you have the second level of Tzadik Yisrael, and all of the days are good. But it's the same person. If it's the same person, if it's finally Israel comes, is about to die, and all of his days gather, and they come up, they all come up to God, and they're all rectified, that means it includes the bad days. The, the bad 17 years, and even the, bad, the other bad years, that were even worse. 
they all come. That's what the Zohar says. The Zohar t- tells us, he gives us this very pessimistic idea, it would appear, that there are lost days. There is such a thing as a lost day. Days that I wasted, time that I wasted, precious time that I wasted doing nonsense, or even worse than nonsense. But then the Zohar tells us, no, if you use your time to connect to the Yisrael within you, your higher self, and you do tshuva, you retroactively rectify and raise all the lost days. That's what the Zohar is ultimately, it's, it's not explicitly saying, but it, it's there if you put one and one together. The Zohar is telling us in the end that the final 17 years retroactively rectified the first 17 years. It's not just good and good or good and better. It's that the better took the bad and elevated that as well. And if you do tshuva, if you if you do, what's the word? Uh, what's the word for tshuva? I'm, I'm, suddenly I've, I've lost this, the most simple, important word. Um, if you if you rectify those days that you that you have left, uh, that you that you that the, you were they were wrong before. If redemp no, it's not redemption. Repentance. Thank you very much. So when we when you repent, when you do repentance, when you do tshuva, is when you you're able to take the bad days or the not so good days or the days wasted, and you're able to somehow transform them also for the good. So it's a it's a big question how you do that, but the fact remains. And we're left with this message at the end of the of the Zohar that we studied, that ultimately, if we, if as you're nearing your end, and you're gathering your days, and you're looking back at them, and and of, again it goes for every moment of our life now, regardless of our age, could be very young, it doesn't matter. We want to make sure that we can look back and we can look at lost days and, and weeks and months and years and decades maybe. And we look back and say, what did I do all those years? Big waste of time. But it's, it's not. If you, a full rectification, a full repentance or atonement is when you're able to take those days and see how there were sparks in them. This is why, by the way, the last 17 years are in Egypt, outside of El Tisrael. Is when you when you're looking at all everything that's negative that's outside, and you're rectifying and elevating and taking the sparks out of that, then ultimately, it makes all of the days of your life good. Just like in the in the first seventeen years prior to that, he said, hundred and thirty years were bad, all a big waste of time. Seventeen years later, he's able to say all of the hundred and forty-seven years were good. That's what we end up with. So this is our soul of the parsha for Vayechi, and the final message is of course Chazak Chazak Venit Chazak. We should be all married to be strong and strong and stronger uh, with with our days as they're progressing and advancing better and better. Chazak Chazak Venit Chazak, constantly evolving from good to better. Hi, if you enjoyed this video, please press like and subscribe to the channel. Also, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Patreon is a platform for supporting independent creators. You can find the link in the description below. Thank you very much.